but they are not the only members uh, in marine uh, environment with such kind of body. So tinafros um, also um, they they also uh, have a um, similar kind of uh, appearance to the true jellies. So um, we call them uh, comb jellies. Um, the tinafros. Um, they are uh, radial animals. They show a radial symmetry, uh, closely resemble the jellies. And their transparent bodies make them difficult to see in water. Um, uh, but uh, the very significant is uh, like how we can um, separate uh, these tinafros from the true jellies is uh, because uh, these comb jellies, they lack stinging cells. So um, here you can see uh, in this diagram, this is the schematic uh, representation of the anatomy of this tinafos. So here um, they have uh, this kind of, I uh, mean, um, the radial um, eight rows of comb plates uh, with, um, See, uh, which is a line, like which is um, consist with cilia. So here you can see um, um, bands of cilia uh, along the um, this um, radial. We can say radial rows. Um, so there are eight rows uh, around the body. So that um, their radial body. Uh, they have an uh, apical organ here, and the mouth and uh, and the aboral canal, uh, which is connected to um, the um, yes, uh, the end uh, of the anus part of the body. So um, they are named uh, for the eight rows of comb plates. This kind of comb plates. It's steam and the animal uses for locomotion. So with the beating of the cilia, um, these uh, tina for animals, they can move in the water column. So mostly these animals, um, they are pelagic. Uh, they are found uh, in water column. So um, the comb plates are made up of very large cilia. And um, when the cilia beat, the animal uh, able to move. Tinafros are weak swimmers, um, are mostly found in surface waters. They are not powerful enough to uh, enough swimmers to make much forward progress, but they can move up and down in the water column. That's uh, kind of significant for this tinafros. Like jellies, they can't uh, like move fast, but they can move up and down and be in the water column. At the, uh, at the apex of each uh, animal, there's a small transparent bubble-like structure. Uh, it's kind of a statocyst, um, which uh, balance their movement, a sensor kind of thing. Like Nidarian xenophores um, exhibit radial symmetry, but they lack the stinging cells. That's the important thing. So the delicate bodies of tinafos are uh, iridescent during the day. Um, they they appear like water uh, uh, with little uh, color. But uh, at night, almost all tinafos they give off flashes. They they produce light luminescence. So a uh, possibility to attract uh, it's said to attract the mates or prey or frighten the potential predators. So that's a mechanism. Uh, so they produce um, luminescence, which we can call it bioluminescence. So the thing is, uh, we have studied uh, about the bioluminescent planktons when we were referring about the dinoflagellates, especially. So um, they, uh, they are responsible to uh, make the ocean blue uh, during night. But um, this species, uh, the comb jellies, they are also responsible for the luminescence of many seas. 
so it's um, it's a significant one and also the tenophores are carnivorous they're feeding on zooplankton larval fish and fish eggs so here you can see how they are uh, this is the mouth and the anal pores so they uptake other uh, small fish uh, larvae and then um, they digest it and eliminate so this is how they appear even on sand or water it's, um, kind of water there's no color but um, they are they um, a like they produce luminescent during night uh, so this is called a uh, sea gooseberry or pleura, uh, uh, pleurobranchia. So, um, these go these are sea gooseberries. So they have a very uh, spherical kind of body with two tentacles. So uh, this is sea walnut. So use both tentacles. I'm sorry, like for that the 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 one the gooseberry they use both tentacles and their mucus um, mucus covered uh, oral surface to capture prey especially uh, small crustaceans the tenophores uh, uh, bureau is uh, cylindrical and has no tentacles so i i can show the i can show the um, like the picture in the next slide, uh, it feeds on other tenophores. So, Peter, they uh, feed on other tenophores. Uh, when its mouth comes in contact with other tenophores, the prey is sucked in. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's how uh, they prey on. But this uh, sea walnut and all the the. The gooseberry one, they have the tentacles, so they try, they capture the food and uh, put it in the mouth. So, but it, this is something different. So they move um, the stolen singers to their tentacles and use them instead of uh, adhesive cell for capturing prey and for defense. The tina fours. Uh, Euchlora rubra feeds on jellyfish and saves the uh, nematocyst. So they uh, they feed on jellyfish as well. So here you have the bureau, and then the almost all species of stenophores are hermaphroditic, and most species uh, appear to shed their eggs and sperms directly into the water where the fertilization takes place. So it's kind of an external one. But a few species, um, they brood the eggs in their bodies. Uh, fertilized uh, egg develops into free living, uh, free swimming larvae called cidipede larvae um, that resembles the adult tenophores as sim like they have the similar structure to the uh, adult one. So. Tenophores are important predators on zooplankton and larvae uh, play a significant role in managing the size of zooplankton population. So that's very important when it comes to uh, their ecological role. So they, they manage uh, the size of the zooplankton, manages the uh, size of the zooplankton population. They also prey on fish eggs and larvae and thus play a role in regulating the fish population. So, tenophores uh, channel nutrients to larger plankton feeders as they are consumed for food. So, through the food chain or food web, they channel the nutrients to upper uh, trophic levels. So, that's their ecological role. So now we are moving to flatworms. So flatworms, uh, when we say it's flatworms, they're flat. They have a flattened body, which uh, exhibit bilateral symmetry. So they're not the radial one. So they are bilateral symmetric. And they have a um, definite head. And here you can see uh, with some sensors and a 
prominent posterior body very long one so some flat bombs such as uh, tubularians um, class tubularia or tubularia uh, we can say are uh, free living organisms they uh, live freely um, they can be in the water column or they can be in the bottom they they occupy the sediment um, they crawl um, whereas others such as flutes uh, class trematoda and cestoda are parasites so in the next slide uh, i have uh, showed two pictures uh, the flukes and tape forms so they are endoparasites so they are the flukes are, are found in especially on the mammals like uh, the grazing mammals but tape forms uh, they can be in human body the digestive tract of ourselves so uh, of human so so flukes and tape forms um, so tubularians are free living uh, non parasitic they range in size from 5 millimeters to 50 centimeters along about only few centimeters wide and one millimeter thick very thin and a few species are pelagic but most are bottom dwellers and they live in sand or mud under stones and shells or on seaweed tubularians are also common uh, members of my fauna a tiny invertebrates adapted to living in the spaces between sediment particles so um that's a kind of significant uh, thing about this uh, platforms tubularians uh, tubularians body is covered with a layer of cells called epidermis so this um yes um so their epidermis is frequently ciliated so they have cilia uh, in the, uh, um, on the epidermis um uh, the vent i mean the um ventral surface and contain glands that uh, uh the ventral surface and also they contain glands that produce mucus so that's very important so they produce uh, mucus which uh, help them to crawl um or they can swim using cilia uh, cilia uh, beating as well as using this uh, mucus they produce so here you can uh, clearly see they have uh, the sensory organs in their head um, and the whole posterior body um, and also uh, you can see um, in the two ends of the body uh, they it's folded so it increases uh it's a it's a, we can uh, we can say it uh, it's due to like uh it, it's kind of a, a kind of mechanism that they have to increase their surface area of the body um so this form of locomotion uh the gliding i said the swimming uh, using the mucus or the uh, slime they produce this form of uh, locomotion is not efficient for large forms which also use uh, muscle contraction to propel themselves so they are using muscle contraction as well so tubularians uh, have uh, sensory receptors in their head region that can detect light chemicals and movements uh, so that's very important then the most tubularians are carnivores um, feeding on small invertebrates that uh, locate with chemical uh, detecting organs called chemoreceptors they have um, senses to the prey so they use the chemical produced by other organisms to detect their prey small crustacean snails and annelid worms are common prey they can also feed on uh, detritus or the bodies of dead animals that sink to the bottom so they are they're mostly um they occupy the marine sediment or the stones uh, so 
so as they are bottom dwellers whatever the that sinks to the bottom they can feed on it and also the oyster leaves uh, feeds on uh, um, live oysters and also stylo just uh, they feed on barnacles so the this uh, stylochus frontalis they feed on live oysters they say uh, this uh, stylochus tripartius they feed on uh, barnacles so the the common cell flatworms uh, delora uh, lives uh, on the book gills of horseshoe crabs and shares a uh, food of its horse so they they show different um, different kind of um, different kind of uh, uh, food uh, feeding uh, adaptations so that way um, uh, they ha they show um, commensal uh, feeding uh, relationship as well so they can uh, and also they can feed on uh, algae especially diatoms uh, and the tabularians uh, like a convoluta they rely on zooxanthellae uh, for nutrients so they are um, they directly uh, depend on the zooxanthellae to produce their food but so it's kind of a symbi symbiosis so some species uh, subdue their prey by entangling it in the mucus so they are we know that uh, these tabularians they produce mucus so that way um, they uh, entangle the prey in the mucus and then um, they um, yes and also they do like they are pinning it against a solid surface until it suffocate and then they can uh, consume it a few are known to stab prey with a, a, an organ called stylet so a very in the end of their body part uh, they have a pointed very sharp uh, uh, a, a projection uh, which we can call it as a stylet so they used to um, uh they used to uh project that stylet to the uh, on the prey uh so that way uh, they can paralyze uh the prey and have it like so once the prey is captured the animal extend a muscular tube called pharynx so here you can see the ventral the 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 under body part of the tabularian so this is how it appears so from the mouth um, uh, they have the pharynx and intestine uh, mostly they are branched uh, so here you can see so this uh, is the gastrovesicular cavity and like so once uh, they capture the food they have the food now so some they exhibit this kind of mechanism where the pharynx out of its mouth they put the pharynx out of its mouth and palms out the enzymes to the prey and sucks out the body fluid or suck the pieces of the food and tabularians without the pharynx swallow the prey whole so only they have the mouth so they swallow the whole prey so the food is digested inside or uh, in the gastrovesicular cavity some species have gastrovesicular cavities with lateral branch here you can see so their intestine is branched which helps to increase the surface area for digestion and absorption okay they don't have um, a circulatory well developed one circulatory system so um then that way through the branching they can distribute the food okay and then the when it comes to their ecological role uh tabularians that live uh, in the spaces between sediments um feed on food items that are too small 
example large organisms so that's very important these uh, small uh, organisms they occupy the spaces where the large organisms they cannot occupy so thus funneling nutrients to higher trophic levels when they become prey so they consume these detritus small larvae fish which are not consumed by the upper trophic level organisms but they funnel the uh, nutrients to the upper uh, upper uh, trophic levels when they are consumed by other uh, animals some tabularians are important predators and they in turn are prey for high level consumers other tabularians are important uh, so i said as already we saw that they are showing commensal mutualistic um, uh, relationship with are between other organisms so that's very important and some are parasitic so that way they regulate the population so we know that the parasitic uh, ones they they can uh, bring down uh, one um, host they yes they um they lower the fitness we know that the parasites they lower the fitness um um that way they regulate the population so next um ribbon worms uh so that's uh coming under phylum nematia uh so most are benthic but some uh, deep water species uh, they are pelagic at some locations ribbon worms are cons uh, species at low tide they crawl across barnacles and mussel beds and some species are found coiled uh, under stones at low tide or buried uh, in bottom sediments other live in empty mollusk shells, live in seaweeds or swim near the surface. Some form uh, semi-permanent burrows uh, in the mud that are aligned with meekers. Um, so they resemble flat forms, but, but they are thicker, kind of round. So some species, they can uh, go, uh, grow up to 30 meters. Most are pale, like here you can see, but few are very colorful. Uh, and also they can reproduce asexually by fragmentation. So species are separate and they show for the uh, external fertilization. So ribbon worms are carnivores, uh, feed uh, primarily on annelids and crustaceans. Uh, prey are captured by a structure called proboscis, um, that's uh, the extension from the mouth. Some species have sharp uh, stylet at the tip of their proboscis, so at the very end of their mouth they have uh, this stylet. I said, uh, I explained this in the platforms as well, so they have a very sharp uh, 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 a weapon-like thing, so that way uh, they can paralyze the prey so they are called armed ones with which are with stylet um, after the prey is captured it's either swallowed a hole or its tissues are sucked that's how this uh, ribbon worms they uptake their uh, prey and the prey is uh, quickly paralyzed by the uh, injection toxin and then swallowed as the uh, retracting uh, proboscis pulls and prey towards the mouth. So first they inject the toxin, paralyze, and then they swallow. 
So other armed ribbon worms feed on small crustaceans. They kill their prey by uh, piercing the ventral body wall and then forcing their head through the opening. A portion of uh, the digestive tract, uh, the esophagus or the pharynx, is everted through the mouth and the content of the prey is sucked out and digested. Ribbon worms are uh, primarily predators of annelids and crustaceans. Um, the burrowing uh, of benthic species help to move uh, nutrients from deeper sediment to the surface and aerate the bottom because they some ribbon worms they build um, burrows so if that way when they move they aerate the bottom surface of the marine environment as well as they help to move a nutrition from deeper sediments to the surface so that's their ecological role the burrows of ribbon worms can also serve as habitats for other mini organisms after they have been abandoned so actually they uh, create uh, burrows uh, which are very um, very unique um, very uh, well uh, architectured ones so once they uh, abandon that other animals they can uh, live in that um, burrows so they bec the, those burrows become microhabitats for other minute organism as well so we have come to the end of the session thank you uh, for participating for this session thank you